Greetings to everyone and welcome back once again to my educational channel on biology. I'm teacher Janet and in this video we're going to discuss Form 4 Biology KSSM Syllabus Subtopic 13.2 The Urinary System The learning standards for this lesson are as follows. 13.2 Urinary System Firstly, we should be able to identify the structure and functions of a kidney. Secondly, be able to draw, label and explain the structure of a nephron and collecting duct. Number three, describe the formation of urine, which involves the processes of ultrafiltration, reabsorption and secretion. And finally, be able to synthesize the concept of homeostasis by using the negative feedback mechanism in the process of osmoregulation. Here is an overview of this subtopic, 13.2, the urinary system. So firstly, we're going to discuss the structure and the parts of the urinary system plus their functions, the functions of the various parts. Then we will uh, zoom in on the kidneys, we'll study the structure and function of the kidneys. And in the kidneys, there are nephrons, which are the basic units of uh, the kidneys function to produce the urine. So we'll be studying the structure of the nephron and the functions of the various parts, right? So this part is quite important. Now next, we'll be studying the formation of urine. So three processes are involved. Firstly, ultrafiltration. Secondly, reabsorption. And thirdly, secretion. So all these will be discussed in this video too. Finally, there is the last part, the mechanism of homeostasis and involving the process of osmoregulation, okay, which is the regulation of the blood osmotic pressure of a human being. So we're going to study the role of the hormone called antidiuretic hormone in the reabsorption of water in the body. Now this will be discussed in the second video. It's a short video. Now the human urinary system. Firstly, what is the meaning of homeostasis? It is defined as the regulation of the physical and chemical factors of the internal environment. That means the tissue fluid that bathes the cells and also the blood. So it's the regulation of these physical and chemical factors of the blood and the tissue fluid within normal ranges for cells to function in optimum conditions. So the physical and chemical factors involved include temperature and pH of blood, all right, and also the salt and water concentration of the blood and the tissue fluid. So uh, the human urinary system plays an important role in homeostasis because it helps to regulate the blood osmotic pressure by controlling or regulating the amount of uh, salt and water in the blood and tissue fluid. So the urinary system is made up of the kidneys, ureters, bladder and urethra. Now, uh, the process of homeostasis involving the hu human urinary system, okay, will be discussed in the in video number two, okay? So let's go on to the function of the urinary system first. It is to excrete the nitrogenous wastes such as urea, so it is a system that's involved in excretion. It helps to regulate the volume of body fluids. For example, the volume of water in the body fluids, like blood and other body fluids. Blood osmotic pressure, so it helps to regulate the blood osmotic pressure, which depends on the concentration of salts and water in the blood, right? This will be discussed more in the second video. Ion concentration in body fluids, electrolyte content. And by controlling or regulating the ion concentration in body fluids, such as the concentration of hydrogen ions, it can help to regulate the blood pH. Normal blood pH is pH 7.4. Here are the parts of the urinary system. 
Let's start with the renal artery here, the pink structure here. The renal artery branches off from the hilta and transports the blood to the kidneys, to the two kidneys. So the renal artery carries oxygenated blood from the lungs and uh, it carries the oxygenated blood from heart to the kidneys. So this blood contains a lot of oxygen, but also contains a lot of waste products such as urea, uric acid, and excess salts. So it transports this blood to the kidneys so that the kidney can get rid of the toxic waste substances, all right? Like urea, uric acid, and also get rid of excess salts. So uh, after the blood has been filtered in the kidney, the blood that flows out through the renal vein will contain less of these waste products, but it has a lot of carbon dioxide, which is the byproduct of respiration of the cells in the kidney. So renal vein carries the deoxygenated blood back to the heart, and the blood in this vein is filtered. So it contains less waste products and a lot of carbon dioxide. Next is the kidney. So the kidney excretes waste products such as urea, and it also regulates the blood osmotic pressure and the blood pH. We'll be discussing that later. Now, ureter. Ureter carries urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. It's the white tube-like structure here, right? So ureter carries urine from the kidneys downwards to the urinary bladder. Then the urinary bladder is a muscular sac that stores urine before excretion. And lastly is the urethra, which is a short tube below the urinary bladder. The function of urethra is to carry urine or channel urine from the urinary bladder to the external environment. All right, when a person uh, passes out the urine and the urethra helps to remove the urine from the body. Discuss the structure and function of the kidneys. So each person has a pair of kidneys, which are very important to help us excrete the toxic waste substances from our body, okay, in the urine. So the kidney consists of the cortex, which is the outermost layer here. And then the middle layer is called the medulla. And finally, the innermost layer, which is shaped like a trumpet, is the pelvis. Now, direction of urine flow. Urine is formed in the nephrons of the kidneys. These are the basic units of the kidneys that we will study later. And then uh, from the nephron, it will flow into the pelvis. Pelvis collects all the urine, which is, which is channeled into the ureter here below the kidney, and then to the bladder, and then finally to the urethra, and it will flow out from the urethra to the external environment. Now, number two, state the functions of the kidneys. Three marks. So this is important. It's an SPM pass here question. Now, the kidneys have two main functions. Firstly, it helps to carry out excretion. As an excretory organ, the kidneys excrete toxic waste substances, such as the nitrogenous compounds like urea, uric acid, ammonia, okay, and also creatinine and even drugs and toxins that may have been eaten, right? So one mark if you mention that the kidneys excrete the toxic waste substances and give one, one example, at least one example. Okay. Now, secondly, as an organ of uh, that carries out osmoregulation. So the kidneys control blood osmotic pressure, which depends on the concentration of salts or other dissolved substances in the blood and also water in the blood. For example, as I said, if you drink too much water, the kidney will excrete that excess water for you. If you eat too much salt, the kidney will also excrete excrete the excess salt. Okay. Now, secondly, the kidneys also control the pH of the blood by uh, excreting the excess ions, like hydrogen ions, which cause the pH of the blood to drop, Okay, which makes the blood acidic. So the kidney can also excrete that hydrogen ion, excess hydrogen ion out of the body to maintain the pH of the blood. Right. So uh, here we have two more points for our question. What are the functions of the kidney? 
Firstly, kidneys control the blood osmotic pressure by regulating the concentration of salts and water in the blood. And secondly, the kidneys uh, control or regulate the pH of the blood. Okay, uh, So one mark for this one on blood osmotic pressure, one mark for uh, con regulating the pH of the blood. So altogether, three marks. All right. Now, other than that, the kidneys control the total volume of water in body fluids. So this related to the first point here. Uh, the concentration of ions, not only hydrogen ions, there are also sodium ions, chloride ions, potassium ions in body fluids, and also uh, regulates the electrolyte content. Let's look at a section through the kidney. So if you look at the structure of the kidney, the size of the kidney is about 10 cm, all right? Quite big, huh? And then uh, inside we have the cortex, the outermost layer, then the medulla, the center layer, and then the pelvis, which collects the urine and channels it to the ureter, right? So uh, the kidney is covered by a tough outer layer, which is called the renal capsule, to protect it. This layer is dark red in color, as seen here, all right? Now, as for the blood vessels, we have the renal artery that transports uh, the blood, oxygenated blood with a lot of waste products into the kidney. And the renal artery will branch out, as you can see in this picture here, it will branch out to form uh, tiny arterioles and also blood capillaries inside the kidney. All right? Then the renal vein transports the filtered blood that contains a lot of carbon dioxide out from the uh, kidney. All right? It's shown here in blue. Okay, so um, let's look at the basic unit inside the kidney. There it is. Okay, and we'll enlarge this structure. Okay, it looks like this basic unit is called the nephron, which is a functional unit of the kidney that produces urine and excrete waste products. And each kidney has about 1 million nephrons that are situated in this position, uh, that are located in this position all around the all inside the kidney all right so this is the structure of one nephron not neuron eh? nephron okay so the nephron has a uh, something like a head eh? that looks like a cup right and inside there is a mass of blood capillaries or cluster of blood capillaries which we call the glomerulus which we'll study afterwards all right uh, located in this cup like structure called the bowman's capsule right so this is the site or location of a process called ultrafiltration. We'll be talking more about that. And then the Bowman's capsule here is cup-shaped. Its cavity contains the glomerulus or cluster of blood capillaries. All right. And we'll discuss the process of ultrafiltration and formation of urine in the later part of this video. So here are the smart notes for what we have discussed just now about the cortex, medulla, and pelvis. Now the most important parts are the concerning the nephrons, which are the functional units of the kidney that produces urine and excretes the waste products. All right. So one kidney has about one million nephrons, and then we'll discuss the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule afterwards. Now let's study an important structure, which is the structure of a nephron. A nephron is the functional unit of the kidney, the basic functional unit of the kidney that produces urine. So each kidney has about 1 million or more of these nephrons. Now the shape of the nephron uh, in blue uh, is like a snake. Think of a, an eye here, it's like a snake with an open mouth, and then it's coiled at this front end, and then it forms a U-shaped structure here, and it's coiled at the, at the end, right? So this nephron ends here. Right, and it's connected to a collecting duct. So let's look at the parts. Now, the first part of the nephron is the Bowman's capsule that looks like a cup shaped structure and it contains a cluster of blood capillaries called the glomerulus in its hollow center. Right? So the glomerulus is a cluster of blood capillaries formed when the afferent arterial here branches out okay, to form the network of blood capillaries called the glomerulus. After that, the capillaries in the glomerulus will merge again to form the efferent arterial here that transports the blood away from the glomerulus 
and down into the network of blood capillaries here, which I've not shown yet. All right. Now, other than the Bowman's capsule that receives the fluid that is forced out from the blood, there are other parts. There are three more parts. So the fluid that is forced out from the blood will flow into the Bowman's capsule and then it will travel down the rest of the nephron, which we call the renal tubule. A tubule is just a small tube, right? So this looks like a small tube. So the second part of the nephron is the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal means it's near to the front end. Convoluted means that it's coiled up like this. All right, so the proximal convoluted tubule, the short form is PCT, yeah? but I always write out in full. And then the third part is called the loop of Henle, right? Which is a long U-shaped tube that extends downwards into the medulla, the renal medulla of the kidney. Okay, so the short form is LH, huh? L O H or LH. Now, so the loop of Henle has a descending limb in which the fluid will flow downwards and an ascending limb in which the fluid flows upwards. All right? Next, the last part is the fourth partner, which is the distal convoluted tubule. This word distal, think of the word distant. It is far away from the head compared to the proximal convoluted tubule. So we call it the distal convoluted tubule, distant. Huh? It's away from the, far away from the the Bowman's capsule, and it the short form is DCT, eh? distal convoluted tubule. Right, so these are the four parts of the nephron. So urine is produced at the end here, at the end of the nephron, right? And then it will flow into this collecting duct, this is called the collecting duct, which is also joined to other nephrons eh? to collect the urine that's formed. And then the urine flows, urine flows from each collecting duct into the pelvis. And then from the pelvis of the kidney, it will flow out of the kidney into the ureter, right? So each kidney has a lot of these uh, nephrons and a lot of these collecting ducts, okay? Uh, and the top part of the nephron is found in the cortex, the outermost layer of the kidney, whereas the U-shaped loop of Henle is in the medulla. Now let's say you have drawn the nephron, which is the blue structure here, with the four parts, and the Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. And then draw the collecting duct here, okay? Which brings the urine to the pelvis. Now let's draw the system of blood capillaries and the blood vessels. So start with the afferent arterial, which is a branch from the renal artery. It carries the blood into the glomerulus. So actually, the afferent arterial branches out to form a cluster of blood capillaries called the glomerulus. And then after that, the glomerulus merge together to form the efferent arterial that carries the blood away from the glomerulus and down to the other parts of the nephron. Okay, so label... Uh, this structure, afferent arterial, and please draw it bigger. The diameter is bigger than that of the efferent arterial because this is an important adaptation for the process of formation of urine. Okay, and then label this part as the cluster of blood capillaries called the glomerulus. So that's not all because we are going to draw, you can use the red ink pen huh, to draw the system or network of blood capillaries that surrounds the nephron like this. So here, what we have drawn is very simplified. Okay, it's the network of blood capillaries is, of course, more complex than this, actually, right? So the blood will flow down through uh, in the blood capillaries that's sort of entwined around the nephron. And after that, it will be already filtered. Then it will flow back through the venue to the renal vein and then out from the kidney to the heart. Okay? So... You can draw the system of blood capillaries here. And take note that uh, the lower part here, loop of handle, is, handle, is actually in the medulla. All right? And the upper part is in the cortex of the kidney. So this is the complete structure of a nephron.
So here are the notes for the nephron, which we have just discussed just now, right? So you can read through this yourself. It's the same as what I've discussed just now with you. Let's go on to the next part. So we've already finished discussing the urinary system, the kidneys and the nephron. Let's go on to the formation of urine. Now it's interesting to find out how is urine actually formed from the blood so that it can be excreted by the kidneys, right? So let's find out how the waste products from the blood are extracted to form the urine and then to be excreted from the body. Now the formation of urine consists of three processes. First one is ultra filtration and second process is reabsorption and the third one is secretion. Let's find out more. Let's discuss the formation of urine. So formation of urine involves three processes. So we'll briefly discuss them here first and then go into detail one by one. Now the first process is ultrafiltration. It occurs in the Bowman's capsule here. Components of blood are filtered out under high hydrostatic pressure from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. All right. So uh, fluid will seep out from the glomerulus and flow into the cavity of the Bowman's capsule here. Next, reabsorption occurs along the renal tubule. This is the second process. So reabsorption involves a larger uh, portion of the, a bigger portion of the nephron. Now, useful substances, useful substances are reabsorbed from the nephron or renal tubule back into the blood. At the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, and distal convoluted tubule, and also at the collecting duct. So only the useful substances will be reabsorbed. And the direction of flow or direction of movement of the substances is from the renal tubule back to the blood. So it's the opposite of uh, ultrafiltration, okay? Where substances move from the blood into the, into the uh, Bowman's capsule. Lastly, we have secretion which occurs mostly at the distal convoluted tubule. So more waste products or waste substances are secreted out from the blood into the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, so the direction of uh, movement of substances is the same like for ultrafiltration from the blood into the uh, nephron. So these are substances, the substances that move into the nephron are those that are not wanted already. Okay? They are going to be excreted from the body. So all let's talk about the process of ultrafiltration, which is the first process in the formation of urine. So ultrafiltration occurs in the Bowman's capsule. And here we see an enlarged picture of the Bowman's capsule. Now look at the wall of the Bowman's capsule. It's only one cell thick, all right? So it has a very thin wall to allow the fluid from the blood to flow into it. Now let's talk about the blood capillaries and blood vessels here. So first of all, we have the white afferent arterial. Now afferent arterial transports the blood from the renal artery into the space here, into the glomerulus, right? So the afferent arterial branches out to form the glomerulus, which is a cluster of blood capillaries. And then these blood cap capillaries will merge together to form the narrow efferent arterial. Remember the word efferent means exit. Uh? Efferent arterial transports the blood up from the glomerulus. Efferent arterial transports the blood into the glomerulus. So there's an adaptation here for the arterial to help the process of ultrafiltration occur. The adaptation is that the afferent arterial has a larger diameter, is larger than the efferent arterial. Okay, as you can see here. So that means more blood is transported into the glomerulus than uh, blood that flows out. So the, uh, some blood will accumulate in the glomerulus and cause the pressure to build up. So we say that the blood in the glomerulus is under high hydrostatic pressure. Remember this word, huh? high hydrostatic pressure. Write it in your uh, explanation. It's a keyword. 
So the blood entering the glomerulus and in the glomerulus is under high hydrostatic pressure because the diameter of the afferent arterial is larger than the diameter of the efferent arterial. So this high pressure causes ultrafiltration to occur and that is some fluid will seep out from the blood through the walls of the glomerulus or blood capillaries into the cavity of the Bowman's capsule here. Okay, this ultrafiltration. Huh? Uh, so ultrafiltration occurs because of the high pressure, high hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus that forces up some fluid into the Bowman's capsule. Okay, so uh, many components of blood will filter out except the larger components of blood. Smaller components of blood can filter out through the pores of the blood capillaries here. They can come out, but the larger components cannot. Okay, so let's find out what is in the glomerular filtrate. Glomerular filtrate will contain water, urea, glucose, amino acids, salts, sodium, chlor sodium and chloride ions because all these uh, particles or molecules are small enough to pass through the walls of the blood capillaries. But there are no plasma proteins in the glomerular filtrate here, no platelets and no red blood cells because these components of blood are too large to pass through the walls of the uh, glomerulus or blood capillaries. Okay, uh, so remember that the glomerular filtrate is not in the glomerulus. Huh? It has come out from the glomerulus and it is in the Bowman's capsule and also later it will flow down into the rest of the nephron, which we call the renal tubule. Okay, now the important thing to note is this, glomerular filtrate, what is the content of the glomerular filtrate and what is not found in the glomerular filtrate? Okay, so common question is why are there no red blood cells or plasma proteins or platelets in the glomerular filtrate? The answer is because these components of blood are too large to pass through the uh, walls of the glomerulus, okay, or blood capillaries. So they remain in the blood and they'll be transported out of the glomerulus in the efferent arterial, right? And then let's look at this word, ultrafiltration. What we call it ultrafiltration? Ultra means like a, it's a, at a very either large or small level. And so in this case, is this filtration occurs at a microscopic level or small level, okay, tiny, tiny, yeah, it's tiny in these tiny structures. So we call it ultra. Filtration is a process whereby uh, a process that separates solid matter from a liquid by causing the liquid to pass through the pores of a filter. All right. That means it separates the larger particles uh, from the small particles too. Right. Because of this, the walls of the blood capillaries or glomerulus, that acts like a sieve. All right. It acts like a filter. So no plasma proteins, platelets or red blood cells are found in the glomerular filtrate because they are too large to pass through the walls of the blood capillaries. So here are the notes for ultrafiltration, all right? And this is actually a past year question, about two to three marks, and can be even asked as an essay question. So let me go through this very quickly again. Explain the process of ultrafiltration in the nephron. Firstly, mention the afferent arterial has a larger diameter than the efferent arterial, thus blood entering the glomerulus is under high pressure. And this pressure, this high pressure causes ultrafiltration to occur, that is, fluid seeps through the walls of the glomerulus into the cavity of the Bowman's capsule. And the fluid that enters Bowman's capsule is known as the glomerular filtrate. It's no longer in the glomerulus, it's in the Bowman's capsule and in the nephron, but it's called the glomerular filtrate. The glomerular filtrate has the same composition as blood plasma, but it does not contain red blood cells or erythrocytes, platelets, and plasma proteins. Because the size of these components are too large, for them to seep out of the glomerulus or to move out of the glomerulus, the walls of the globe, the walls of the blood capillaries. Thus, red blood cells, platelets, and plasma proteins remain in the blood flowing to the arte efferent arterial. Right? Thus, glomerular filtrate contains smaller molecules like water, urea, glucose, amino acids, salts, sodium, and chloride ions. Huh? But it doesn't have the larger uh, components like plasma proteins, platelets, and red blood cells. Okay, so take note of how you are going to answer. Uh, how to explain the process of ultrafiltration, uh, which is actually A, B, A and B, the main, the main facts, all right? But for longer uh, essay questions, you can write more, okay, like here. Now, next, we're going to talk about 
reabsorption. All right. So reabsorption is a process whereby certain useful substances in the glomerular filtrates, okay, in the Bowman's capsule and the glomerular filtrate has been formed, but certain useful substances from the glomerular filtrate must be moved back into the blood, be transported back into the blood. Why? Because they are useful and they should not be excreted. Okay, whatever remains in the nephron will be excreted. So whatever is not going to be excreted must be reabsorbed back into the blood. All right? So the absorption of the glomerular filtrate occurs along the renal tubule at the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. Okay? So in the proximal convoluted tubule, what are the substances that are reabsorbed back into the blood? Not absorbed, it must be reabsorbed. Okay, because this process is re reabsorption. So at the proximal convoluted tubule here, all the glucose, all the amino acids, and uh, certain sodium ions, okay, uh, amount, a certain amount of sodium ions, will be reabsorbed into the blood by active transport. That means with the use of energy. Okay, but all the glucose will go back into the blood together with all amino acids because they are needed by the body. These are food substances or nutrients that the body needs. Okay, you leave them in the nephron, they'll be excreted, right? So they must be reabsorbed back into the blood. Whereas for chloride ions, they are passively absorbed into the blood without the use of energy, okay? Probably by the process of diffusion. Other chloride ions diffuse back into the blood. And water is reabsorbed by osmosis, also a form of passive transport. Because once the substances like glucose and amino acids enter the uh, blood, all right, it will make the concentration of dissolved substances in the blood capillaries increase and become more than the concentration of uh, dissolved substances in the uh, tubule, in the renal tubule here. All right? So there is a concentration gradient. So water will diffuse from region of lower concentration of dissolved substances, that is the renal tubule, back into the blood by osmosis, right? Okay, so next, how about reabsorption in the loop of Henle? Now for the loop of Henle, we have the descending limb of the loop of Henle where the fluid will flow downwards, okay, in the loop of Henle. And there's reabsorption of water by osmosis at this descending loop, a descending limb of the loop of Henle. Huh? And then after that, the fluid will flow upwards. So this part here is called the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And in this part, two substances are moved back into the blood. That's reabsorption of sodium ions using energy by active transport back into the blood. So sodium ions are reabsorbed back into the blood here in the ascending limb. And also chloride ions. But chloride ions are absorbed by reabsorbed by passive transport without the use of energy. Okay? Whereas sodium ions are absorbed by active transport with the use of energy. Next, there's also reabsorption at the distal convoluted, convoluted tubule here and the collecting duct, right? Uh, These substances reabsorbed at DCT and collecting duct are salts and water. And the reabsorption of these two substances, uh, the salts and water, depends on what the body needs. Depends on the water and salt content in the blood. Let's say you drink a lot of water, so your blood is diluted and you have a lot of water, too much water in the blood. Then it's water that needs to be excreted, so it will not be reabsorbed at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. You'll be allowed to flow uh, to the collecting duct and then out, uh, out of the nephron and it will be sent to the ureter and the bladder for excretion, okay? If you have too much water, then the water is excreted, so it will not be reabsorbed into the body. If you eat too much salt, then the salt has to be excreted, so it cannot be reabsorbed back into the body, all right? It will not be reabsorbed. Less will be reabsorbed back into the body, okay? So this process of reabsorption of water is controlled by the hormone and that is called antidiuretic hormone, ADH, okay, which we, will start, which we have studied in the topic on hormones, all right? Now, what is the function of ADH? It is to increase the reabsorption of 
uh, water back into the blood for a person who hasn't drunk enough and needs water, right? Needs water in his blood. So this water must be reabsorbed back into the blood. So more ADH will be produced to allow or to stimulate the reabsorption of water if a person lacks water in the body. That's just an example, okay? So, uh, so in this, uh, in the distal convoluted tubules, more water, sodium and chloride ions are reabsorbed and that depends on the body's needs. Okay, again, sodium is always uh, reabsorbed by active transport and chloride ions are reabsorbed by passive transport. Water is reabsorbed by osmosis. Now, as for secretion, the last process, we'll talk about it in a short while. So here are the notes for reabsorption at the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, let's read through very quickly. Reabsorption of useful substances occur from glomerular filtrate in nephron, here, inside the nephron, into the blood. So this occurs all along the renal tubule. So the renal tubule is the lower part of the nephron, okay, apart from the Bowman's capsule here. So it consists of the PCT, proximal convoluted tubule, LOH is loop of Henle, and DCT, distal convoluted tubule. Okay, so all along these points, there is reabsorption of, uh, there are reabs reabsor there is reabsorption of uh, different substances, and then the dissolved substances have to move across the walls of the renal tubule into the network of blood capillaries. Right, so reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. For this part, more substances are reabsorbed at the PCT, all right, than in other parts. So all the glucose and amino acids are reabsorbed by active transport using energy. Sodium ions are actively pumped into the blood capillaries by active transport again. Chloride ions are passively reabsorbed by diffusion. So for chloride and sodium ions, they are different. The, the movement is different, right? Now, water diffuses into the blood capillaries by osmosis because when the concentration of solutes or dissolved substances in blood capillaries uh, become higher, especially when solutes or dissolved substances are reabsorbed already, like glucose and amino acids, then the concentration of solutes will be higher. The concentration of dissolved substances is higher in the blood capillaries than that of the glomerular filtrate. Uh, then water will be reabsorbed uh, as, into the, as a consequence into the blood capillaries too, by osmosis. So in the loop of Henle, water is absorbed, reabsorbed by osmosis and sodium ions are reabsorbed by active transport. So water is reabsorbed in the descending limb here. And in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, sodium ions are reabsorbed by active transport. Okay. Now, at the distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts, the DCT and CD, CD is collecting duct, huh? more water and sodium ions and chloride ions are reabsorbed. The amount of water and salts reabsorbed depends on the water and salt content in the blood what, and what your body requires. If body and the blood lacks water, then the hormone, more hormone, uh, more of this hormone, ADH, uh, or antidiuretic hormone, will be secreted so that more water is reabsorbed back into the blood, okay, to make up for the lack of water in the blood. Now, if the body and blood lacks salt, salts instead, okay, maybe they didn't eat enough uh, salts, right? Then another hormone called aldosterone is secreted so that more salts are reabsorbed into the blood, okay? So for our syllabus, we study more of the antidiuretic hormone. And uh, aldosterone has been mentioned once in the topic on hormones. So you still have to know its function. All right. So here is a summary of the process of reabsorption in the nephron. So basically, sodium ions, chloride ions, and water are reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. Right? in all uh, parts of the nephron here. As for glucose and amino acids, all glucose and amino acids are reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule by active transport. So this is a, a table that will help you to remember the facts well. So you can jot it down as part of the smart notes. Now before I go on to secretion, let's take a moment to discuss this question on reabsorption. 
it is also related to a past year question and it's a hot question here. All right. So based on the diagram of cell X in the wall of a renal tubule or nephron, state three adaptations of cell X and the renal tubule for active transport of glucose from uh, the renal tubule into the blood. All right. So take a look at this picture. It shows you the blood capillary beside the wall of the renal tubule. Okay, this part of the renal tubule enlarged. Okay, so this is the blood capillary with blood inside. And the wall, the blue line here, the wall of the renal tubule contains cells that look like this. So we just focus on one cell. Remember the wall of the tubule is only one cell thick. Huh? So this is the layer of cells. Two cells are shown here. So based on the diagram of cell X in the wall of the renal tubule on the front, state three adaptations of cell X as seen from here. Okay, so you have to rely on your powers of observation to see what is so special about the cell. Cells X here, uh, cell X. And uh, what's the adaptation of the renal tubule for active transport of glucose from the renal tubule back into the blood? So you can pause the video for a while and try to answer the question. And then we'll discuss the question in a short while. Okay, let's look at the answer. Now, firstly, if you look at cell X, you can see a lot of these uh, projections, uh, which we call a microvilli. Okay, here it's been labeled for you, all right? But sometimes it's not labeled. So you have to uh, observe it and you have to conclude that this is the, uh, you can conclude that this is uh, like the microvilli, all right? Like what you find in the villus in the small intestine, right? Villus also has cells with, with a lot of microvilli. So the reason for this microvilli is to increase the total surface area of the uh, cell for faster reabsorption of glucose. Okay, glucose has to be reabsorbed into the cell and then has to be transported into the blood capillaries, right? So the bigger the surface area of the cell is, the more glucose it can reabsorb. Okay, and then uh, pass it, let it move into the blood capillaries. Now, what is the second characteristic that you can see here? That is an adaptation of the cell. What is this organelle? Yes, it's the mitochondria. So what's the use of mitochondria? Yes, it is to produce energy. For what purpose in this case? For active transport. Okay. So cell acts as many mitochondria to produce ATP and energy for active transport of glucose into the blood capillaries, okay? Transport through here, okay? Through the, the walls huh, of the cells. Next, the third feature is that the wall of the tubule here is only one cell thick, okay? And this is for faster transport of glucose across it into the blood. Lastly, let's discuss a structured question on the formation of urine. Question 4. The table below shows the approximate composition of three different fluids in different parts of the kidney. So the components that are analyzed are water, glucose, urea, plasma proteins and amino acids. And the three fl fluids are where these components are found and the three fluids that are analyzed are blood in the glomerulus, inside the glomerulus here. It has not filtered out yet. Huh? This blood is still inside the blood capillaries. Then the glomerular filtrate in the Bowman's capsule here, inside the Bowman's capsule. So this is the filtrate that is formed after ultra filtration. Huh? And then lastly, urine, the collecting duct here. Okay, now state the process by which the glomerular filtrate is formed. Yes, it's ultra filtration. Huh? Explain why no glucose or amino acid is present in the urine, although they were present in the glomerular filtrate. Now you can see here that there's some glucose in the blood and in the glomerular filtrate but none in the urine. Huh? And same for amino acids. Present, present, 
not present. So something happened from this point to this point. Along the way uh, in the nephron. And what is that process that occurred to the glucose and the amino acids? Yes, it's reabsorption. Okay, so the glucose and amino acids were reabsorbed back into the blood right now. Huh? From the glomerular filtrate in the proximal convoluted convoluted TV. Let's read. All the glucose and amino acids have been reabsorbed. You can write by reabsorption. Huh? The process is important. Back into the blood in the proximal convoluted tubule by active transport. Okay, two marks. So all the glucose and amino acids have been reabsorbed back into the blood, one mark, in the proximal convoluted tubule, maybe one mark, and active transport, one mark. So please read through questions C and D. They are hot questions and uh, try to answer them. Pause the video and try to answer them first. And after that, we'll look at the answers. Okay, let's read the questions. Explain why plasma proteins are not present in the glomerular filtrate. Okay, so why is it that the plasma proteins do not filter out from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule during the formation of the glomerular filtrate? Now, it's because the plasma protein molecules are too large to pass through the tiny pores of the blood capillary wall uh, in the glomerulus. Okay? Now, if they ask for red blood cells, now, why red blood cells or erythrocytes are not present in the glomerular filtrate, then you have to say that these cells, all right, not molecules, now, these cells are too large. Okay? So, it depends on the question. Now, let's go on to the next one. A patient's urine contains glucose. What disease is he suffering from? from and explain the reason for this symptom. So this is like a past year SPM HOTS question. Okay, it has been asked in the exam. Now, what is the disease? Read the question carefully. What is the disease that he's suffering from? Can you tell me the disease in which the urine contains glucose? Normally, urine should not contain any glucose because all the glucose should be reabsorbed back into the blood. Okay, but for a patient with a certain disease, the urine contains glucose. What is that? Yes, it's Penyakit kencing manis, right? The word kencing manis tells us that the urine is sweet. Huh? Okay, uh, and that disease is actually diabetes mellitus. All right. Now, in the exam, don't write that the symptom for a person with diabetes mellitus is that his urine tastes sweet. Don't write that. Now, you say the urine contains glucose. All right. Don't write urine tastes sweet because nobody's going to taste the urine. All right. To test whether it's sweet or not. Huh? It's just that the word is in the in the name uh, in BM is Paniakit Kenching Manis. Huh? They say urine contains glucose. Okay, for the patient with diabetes mellitus, his urine contains glucose. So, explain the reason for this symptom. Why is it that a patient with diabetes mellitus has urine which contains glucose? So, first of all, his pancreas does not produce sufficient insulin to convert all the excess glucose in blood to glycogen. All. Huh? He may be able to convert some glucose excess glucose to glycogen, but not all. So um, anyway, the blood glucose level will then increase to be higher than normal. And then when the blood flows through the, in the kidney, there is a formation of a glomerular filtrate. And then this glomerular fil filtrate of fluid in the nephron has to be, parts of it, like the, like the glucose in it has to be reabsorbed back into the blood but the kidney is unable to reabsorb all the glucose okay in the renal tubule back to the blood because there's a high too high a concentration of glucose so some of the glucose is excreted in the urine okay uh, that's the reason why a patient with diabetes mellitus will produce urine that contains glucose now we come to the last process involved in the formation of urine and that is secretion so we've already studied the process of ultrafiltration and uh, reabsorption. All right. So let's talk about secretion. Secretion is the process of secreting waste products in the blood 
from the blood into the renal tubules, right? So the waste products are removed from the blood and they are moved into the renal tubules. So these waste products are the ones that are not filtered at the beginning of the process of formation of urine. During ultrafiltration, they were not filtered into the Bowman's capsule. So they were still in the blood and this is a second chance for the blood to, uh, for the body to remove the waste products, all right, through secretion. So this process is the opposite of the process of reabsorption. It's opposite to the process of reabsorption because the, the direction of movement of substances is from the blood to the renal tubules. Whereas for reabsorption, substances move from the renal tubules back into the blood. So secretion, for secretion, the direction of move, movement of substances is similar to that of ultrafiltration, okay, from blood to renal tubules. Now, secretion occurs along the renal tubule and collecting duct, but it's most active here at the distal convoluted tubule. So what are the processes involved in secretion? Simple diffusion and active transfer, right? And substances that are secreted include the following, hydrogen ions, potassium ions, ammonium ions, urea, creatinine, toxic substances, and drugs. So uh, that's why uh, if a person were to ingest drugs, it can be tested. They can be, the, the urine can be tested for drugs, okay, to prove that they have taken the drugs, eaten the drugs. Drugs will be found in the urine because they are excreted uh, in the urine. Right, so what is the purpose of secretion? It is to get rid of the toxic wastes and it also helps to regulate the levels of ions like hydrogen ions and potassium ions in the blood. So in this way, it can help to regulate blood pH. Secretion helps to regulate blood pH because if the blood becomes too acidic and has excess hydrogen ions, then uh, they can be removed from the blood through secretion so that the urine will contain the excess hydrogen ions, right? So these are the notes for secretion, which I've discussed just now. All right. Uh, I think you can read through this, especially I will concentrate on this part. Huh? Substances secreted into the renal tubule from the blood into the renal tubule include uh, hydrogen, excess hydrogen ions, potassium ions, uh, ammonium ions, cre urea creatinine toxins and drugs, and the role of secretion is to get rid of toxic wastes like urea and uh, toxins from the body, to regulate the levels of ions, the hydrogen ions in the blood, because it can get rid of excess hydrogen ions, and by excreting hydrogen ions, the kidney will help to regulate the blood pH. So that is at its normal level of pH. Right. Urine formation. So when the renal fluid reaches the collecting duct here, after it has flowed out from the nephron, only a small amount of salts are left and most of the water has been reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Okay. So the remaining renal fluid is called urine. So urine is formed at the end of the nephron and it flows into the collecting duct. Here, a small amount of urea can also, also diffuses out into the surrounding fluid and the blood capillaries due to its small molecular size, right? Then what is in the urine? The urine contains a lot of water, a bit of urea, sodium chloride ions, and sodium ions and chloride ions is also other salts, uh, like ammonium ions also uric acid and creatinine. So this urine will flow from the collecting duct to the pelvis in the kidney and then out from the kidney into the ureter and you'll be channeled to the bladder and then to the urethra and finally excreted from the body. Right, that's all for this lesson. I hope that you have benefited from it. Please share, like and subscribe. And goodbye for now.